it's hard really uh, to, you know, when you're on day three of an, of an event like this, to figure out what is it that you haven't heard already? What is it that you don't already know? You already know, of course, that we live in times of tumultuous change. I mean, I think whether you're sort of Ben Ali in, in Tunisia or whether you're the chief of police in Oakland, you now know that one tiny little episode can spiral hopelessly out of control and send you over a tipping point. This geopolitical shift, this power shift from west to east or north to south or whatever particular configuration you want to give it, one of its downsides was that governments like yours here that might in the past have been ardent champions of human rights and freedoms around the world became a little more willing to turn a blind eye when the perpetrator government was either a source of capital or a big market or a, a resource provider, especially if it's energy resources. So if you live in Turkmenistan, for example, Western Europe today is unwilling to champion the cause of human rights defenders in Turkmenistan because they really, really need those gas pipelines to come through so they're no longer dependent on Mr. Putin's whims about whether they can heat their homes in winter or not. The economist Nouria Rubini has described our current situation not as one of G7, G8, G20, G194, but really G0. Because we know that all the big problems of our times are global and they're interconnected, whether it's climate or pandemics or um, terrorism or any of these things, even just economics. Uh, but we have no global governance because in many Western countries, domestic politics and domestic economics are, are now the focus of, of government attention. The emerging countries have very clearly spelled out that they're no longer, not, not, not yet ready to take on a leadership role when it comes to solving these global issues. And whether it's Europe that is embroiled in its crisis or your administration here that is focused on fighting these domestic battles, or whether it's Canada or the Scandinavians, we've got this vacuum of global leadership. That means that while our, we understand that the problems are global, we understand that they're urgent, we simply do not have the mechanisms that will allow us to fix this. For civil society, there was another problem, and this was more internal to us. Um, which was, I think we were blindsided in part by rationality. So when this big implosion happened on Wall Street and rippled around the planet, many in civil society said, ah, so now everyone will get what we've been saying all these decades, that the system is broken, that we need fundamental reform. And so there was almost a complacency in civil society that said, we don't need to advocate this anymore. Now it's a no-brainer, you know, how can anyone not see this? And we were surprised, I think, by the severity, the scale, and the viciousness of the fight back, or the fight against any kind of meaningful reform. Many of us were also blindsided, I think, by our proximity to power, by the, by the embeddedness, by the fact that we had this access into Congress and into its equivalents around the world. And we thought that we could use that influence uh, productively in this new scenario, and found that the political spectrum shifted on us very dramatically. I think we were also blindsided by habit. There's stuff we know how to do. We know how to conceive the, the, the big global campaign and make the appropriate colored wristband and print the appropriate t-shirt and come up with the appropriate bumper sticker. We don't know how to deal with a, with, a, with a situation where the messaging is gonna come from the communities rather than from a think tank sitting in Washington or in London or anywhere else. Like many people I, in this room, I'm, I'm in, inherently an optimist, and yet I ended 2010 in a state of utter, utter despair. Uh, I had never been that depressed in my life. I didn't know how to handle it. Fortunately, come 2011, everything changed, and it changed like that. As Lenin put it, sometimes decades pass and nothing happens, and then weeks pass and decades happen. And from the Arab Spring and the impact of technology there to citizens' movements from the Middle East and North Africa to China, India, Israel, Chile, the UK and Europe, we have seen this coming together of these people that we so often call ordinary, 
ordinary people, ordinary citizens coming together and reclaiming the power of decision making over their lives, reclaiming their rights, re demanding new levels of accountability, and most of all, demanding dignity and justice. What, what, da what they said at Davos, what the World Economic Forum said, was that really the only counterbalance to this, these problems we found ourselves confronted by would be an informed, well-mobilized global public opinion with shared norms and values of global citizenship. But this is not, fully, not yet fully developed. And this, in a sense, is what civil society is meant to do. Yet civil society is confronting this, what, what, what we've referred to for the last three days as this short-termism. All of us are now day traders. All of us are, there's these day thinking politicians regulating day trading bankers, all covered by people with 140 character attention span. But we're at a moment, I mean, it's been repeated over the last three days, in the midst of all this doom and gloom, we may be facing what is the biggest opportunity of our lifetimes. Because for the first time in my lifetime, the pieces are all in play. The paradigms are all up for challenge. And so we actually have the opportunity not to have to go down the beaten path, but to create the future that we, that we all believe in. We may be on the verge of this great transition. And in the great transition, this is me gazing into my crystal ball so you can completely disregard it. I think that the real conflict is not going to be between states and markets, or between markets and civil society, or between this religion and that, or between developed and developing. The real polarization is going to be between entities, whether they're governments, companies, NGOs, media houses, other groups that believe in the concept of consent as being fundamental, versus governments, media, businesses, and NGOs, and so on, that fundamentally subscribe to notions of control. It's consent versus control that is the big battle, in my view, of the 21st century. We know that in this new model, that trust is the single most important currency that we own. Our biggest asset is the confidence that people have that when we tell them something, that we're telling them the truth, that they can depend on us, rely on us, count on us. We're looking at this huge transition between the hubris of the masters of the universe to the humility that says, out there on that street corner are people who actually know what they need and may be in a better position to tell us what we ought to be doing than all the experts and all the think tanks combined. More than know what or know how, the key differentiator between those that succeed and don't in this century or in this time will be those who fundamentally know why they do what they do. The better we are at defining our purpose as individuals, teams, organizations, sectors, countries, communities, the more successful we're going to be. Because it's purpose that we're going to, that's going to keep us grounded in a period of tumultuous change. You're not going to have all your old decision rules may be redundant at this point. Summing it up, it's Tony Blair, hardly my favorite person, but really, I think in this case, he had it right. It's interdependence that's the defining characteristics. We know that the economics is well matured, the politics is not. We need to articulate a, a common global policy on based on values, or else we risk our stability, economic and political. And we here is not the West. We here is not technocrats. We here is not experts sitting you know, in TV studios. We here is anyone that believes in religious tolerance, openness to others, democracy, lib liberty, and human rights administered by secular courts. We can no more opt out of this struggle than we can opt out of climate change, regardless of whether we're business or civil society. And if it seems lonely out there sometime, being out on the vanguard of this movement like you guys are, it for me, it certainly helps to remember Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you.